Greetings and salutations gamers, my name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to the Dark Souls Challenge. Last time, we took on an absolute mountain of a challenge and defeated almost every boss with only the Armor of Thorns on New Game Plus. For my next challenge, I thought it would be interesting to try and take on a challenge that served to be the exact opposite of the Armor of Thorns. At first, I thought maybe trying to beat the game without rolling, but to be honest, that felt a bit too easy. I wanted a challenge that went beyond not rolling, a challenge that would be far more detrimental and in a smaller realm of possibility. And then it hit me. What if we took the little green bar away altogether? I looked into it for a few minutes and figured out it's not only possible, but far easier than you'd think. But before we get into the specifics, let's go over the rules. As the name of the challenge implies, I cannot take any action that costs stamina. We'll go over all the actions this entails in just a minute, but overall if you see that green bar go down, then it's off limits. If for some reason my instincts kick in and I accidentally do something like roll, then I have to forfeit that life by running it into a death box or by letting an enemy have their way with me. That actually sounds kind of weird out of context, don't take that out of context. The challenge begins as soon as we spawn in the asylum and ends upon defeating Gwyn. We also will not be allowing the use of any major glitches in this run, and as always we will be doing every possible boss in the game. And finally, I just wanted to say that if you've been enjoying these Dark Souls challenges and are looking forward to seeing future challenges, go ahead and bop that subscribe button if you haven't already. Besides that, I hope you are having a wonderful day, and without further ado, this is the Dark Souls Without Stamina Challenge. Okay, so first of all, let's actually talk about what a stamina list challenge even looks like. Because the first question people are probably going to have is, how? Well, let's look at all the actions that a character can do that cost stamina, and all the actions that are stamina free. Everything that a character can do that drains stamina is attacking, rolling, jumping, sprinting, backstepping, parrying, blocking, shooting, and kicking. So basically, we're restricted of every movement option that is not just your basic walking and almost every form of attack. However, some of you may have already noticed that there is a something, a big something, that is missing from this list. In Dark Souls 1, casting magic does not consume stamina. This means that we can effectively use any magic in the game, and some of you might already be ahead of me. We've completed this game with every type of magic in the game, so theoretically it's possible. However, this time we've been extremely limited by the amount of options we have. We can walk and cast magic. That's it. We basically have no defensive options unless we can somehow walk out of the way of the attack or face tank the blow. Also keep in mind that magic has a casting time, and if an enemy gets right in our face and decides to start stun locking us, there's not much we can do. The upside to this run is because we aren't limited to any one type of magic, we can come up with some pretty potent combinations of magic, but before we get to that point, we've got to make it through the early game. Early on in the game, our spell options are quite limited, so we'll have to be creative to find our way to the more powerful late game magic. In every sense, this challenge is going to be the exact opposite of Thorns. We now have some of the most powerful offensive potential in the game, but the trade-off is we've been completely stripped of defense. Fights are going to go from 40 minute thorn slogs to fights that could last only a few seconds. I also wanted to make a short note here and say that consumables such as firebombs don't consume stamina when you use them, but I personally didn't realize this until I got to the DLC, so Big Brain Kyle strikes once again. I think that just about covers all the can do's and absolute don'ts. Let's see how it all went. We name our character Dyspnea, the medical term for the shortness of breath, and pick the sorcerer for the starting soul arrows. Getting through the asylum isn't much different from a regular run, although we do have to be careful against the asylum demon. In a normal run, we would plunging attack the demon, but we don't have the stamina to do so, and if we land in front of the demon, then we'll be stuck in a falling animation in front of him, which leaves us open to attack. From there, it's an RNG festival to see if we can get away from him. However, if we time our drop just as the Asylum Demon flies up to break the platform, then we can land just beneath him, where his landing animation will cancel ours. This lets us move around and get into a much better position to kill him off with soul arrows. Once we arrive in Firelink, we grab some souls from nearby areas and kill some hollows nearby as well as some enemies in Undead Berg. This will give us enough souls to buy force from Petrus, and we can get a talisman as well as some homeward bones in the elevator stash. 
Force doesn't deal any actual damage, but without any kind of mobility or the ability to kick, it's going to be hard to navigate some of these areas. However, Force is great for getting us out of sticky situations and helping us navigate through tricky sections. With Miracle and Sorcery in hand, we navigate through the Undead Burg, lure Havel up the tower in order to head into the garden and back up by Andre. We head back through the church gates grabbing the lower Berg key on the way, use Force under the bridge to navigate our way to the ladder shortcut back to Berg, and finally open the lower Berg door by the Taurus Demon. This route essentially lets us navigate a lot of the early game areas without actually having to fight any bosses. I then purchase the Resident Key in order to free Griggs of Vinheim in the lower Berg. He's got some fairly powerful spells for this early on in the game, but first we're going to need the cash to buy them and the levels to cast them. So an early game source of souls in Undead Berg. Guess you all know what that means. We farm the dragon for about 7 minutes before we have about enough souls to purchase Great Soul Arrow, our main source of damage for a fair bit of the early game. Now armed and ready, we take on the Taurus Demon, and let me just say that Taurus Demon is already a pretty easy boss without rolls. All of his attacks can be avoided by just walking backwards, and 9 Great Soul Arrows later we have claimed boss number 2. Now, you'd think any sane person would go to the gargoyles next, or maybe farm for souls. But me? Oh no, I decided to be stubborn. I have a checklist of equipment and spells I want in order to maximize our damage as soon as possible and end this early game as fast as we can. So I decided to go to the catacombs. Now, if you were to guess what boss I died most to, you would probably say Manus, Calamite, maybe even Bed of Chaos. But let me tell you that none of these peasants can even comprehend the power of Dark God and Destroyer of Worlds, Pinwheel. Yes, the boss that I died to the most in this run was Pinwheel. Now hindsight is 2020. I should have just done either the Gargoyles or Moonlight Butterfly, or even just farmed souls, but there was some little part of my brain that decided to throw a tantrum like a toddler and say, "No, we're killing Pinwheel, yeah." And that tantrum caused me to die to Pinwheel a total of four times. All jokes aside though, pinwheel this early and without stamina is actually kind of a challenge. We have no way to really avoid the fireballs and armor this early on has pretty garbage fire resistance. Couple that with the fact that when his health gets low enough, he spams the room full of clones and suddenly we've got a formula for early game disaster. It took more tries than I like admitting, but at the end of it all, we took pinwheel down and claimed a nice stack of souls accompanied by a mask of the mother. With the souls we claimed from Pinwheel and the enemies on the way out, we bought the Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring from Griggs, which will be another boost to our magic's damage. We make our way back up to the Parish Bonfire and use the excess souls from enemies along the way to crank up our intelligence. It should be noted that the intelligence scaling on the base catalyst is actually very powerful, so even small upgrades in intelligence along the way is going to make a very noticeable difference in damage. Into the church to grab the Firekeeper soul, take out the Pink Gang with just normal soul arrows and free Lore Trek. We can't kick him over the ledge, but Force is more than enough to do the trick and grab us the Ring of Favor and Protection as well as 5 extra humanity. One quick run down to the Ghost Town gets us an additional Firekeeper Soul and our Estus Flask then upgrades to plus 2. At this point we're pretty stacked, so it's Gargoyles time. Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring, Great Soul Arrows, and a Great Catalyst is fantastic damage and because we killed Pinwheel we have 20 plus 2 Estus Flasks. However, when there's two Gargoyles at a time, it's tricky to find an opportunity to attack. Eventually though, they both decide to breathe fire at the same time giving us the opportunity to finish the fight. At this point we went ahead and took out Andre because I wanted the crest of Artorias to get into the basin early and 20,000 souls is a rip off. From here we killed off the Moonlight Butterfly, I don't think I need to elaborate on what that fight looked like, and grabbed the Elite Knight armor set. It's going to be a great set of armor to have on hand in case I want some budget poise in the equipment setup. From here we walked through the hunters and grabbed the stone armor near the mushroom area and made our way around to the wolf ring for its added poise. These two things put together are a super powerful combo early on, which we're going to use to absolutely chat our way through the Capra Demon boss fight. We get to almost entirely ignore the boss and his dogs with this setup, just tanking through practically everything and play the fight how we please. That's another boss fight down. 
The big reason I wanted to get into the depths this early on is to free Laurentius. He's going to be a very important component to this run, but we'll get back to that in just a second. First we head down to Dark Brew Basin. Without mobility and only magic damage to our name, the golems are quite annoying. However, with some clever movement we can bait the Hydra into killing the golems for us. From there we put back on our super poise setup to take on the Hydra. After taking off all its heads, we can slowly make our way over to the crystal golem to free Dusk. The golem is a bit tricky, but the edges of the cave curve up just enough to get us out of the water for some normal movement. After the golem goes down, we free Dusk and buy Hidden Body and cast Light. Then we quickly head back to the cavern to grab her Crown of Dusk. This is going to give us yet another damage boost for all our forms of magic. My early game setup is almost complete, just one more thing we need to output some major damage. We get back to Firelink Shrine and obtain the Pyromancy Flame from Laurentius. After this, we head through New Londo and Valley of Drakes into Blight Town. Climbing up from the swamp, we can grab the final buff we need to our super build, Power Within. This, my friends, is the most broken spell in the game. This Pyromancy is a buff that slowly decreases your health just like Poison would, but in exchange gives you two things. Increased Stamina Regen, which we will of course not be using, and a 40% increase to all scaling forms of damage. Yes, this includes magic. I don't think you need me to tell you this, but 40% is quite a lot. In number terms, that basically means that every attack is almost an attack and a half. With Power Within and our equipment buffs, we can kill Quaylike in just 5 great heavy soul arrows. Ladies and gentlemen, we have officially departed from the early game. The Bounce House is open, and now we've begun to evolve from a crippled human into a Destroyer-class warship. We sure as hell move as fast as one. Next on the list is to grab the Great Chaos Fireball from the Daughter of Chaos before grabbing the third Firekeeper Soul and heading back to Firelink. A quick trip into the Bounce House and we can bait the snake into a jab attack to break the wall. Here we can free Big Hat Logan to begin gathering armaments for Sorcery Winter. After using some of the souls in our inventory, we can get enough souls to grab ourselves Soul Spear. But before we can start destroying things with it, we're gonna need just a bit more intelligence. First step to fixing that is another trip through the catacombs and into the Tomb of the Giants to grab the Silver Serpent's Ring, which should hopefully cover our soul needs for the rest of the run. Next we head into the Dark Root Basin, cause it's danger doggo time. Sif is a very tricky boss without stamina. My philosophy with this boss is usually the lighter and faster the better. We are certainly light, but by no means fast. If she decides to jump around too much, then our fight is pretty much over. Thankfully, the second try we get some great RNG and she stays right on top of us long enough to get the kill. I'm still a tad short on souls, but with the Silver Serpent's Ring we can farm the Forest Hunters for only about 3 minutes before we meet the intelligence requirements for Soul Spear. This Tomahawk Missile of a spell with Power Within is already cranking out over a thousand damage per cast. Convinced Power Within is broken yet? Oh don't worry, it'll get worse. In the meantime we cross the Gaping Dragon off our list. Back to Logan to grab another weapon of mass destruction, the Homing Soul Mass. This thing isn't as powerful as Soul Spear, but we can still combo with it for massive burst damage. Bounce House of Death Time, and at first I did find some trouble defaulting to my usual strats, which usually involves sprinting that I currently lack for obvious reasons. This costed me a few deaths here and there, but as soon as I reassessed and got back on track, the rest of it went by pretty smoothly. Iron Golem is next on the list, and just look at that. It's disgusting. Seriously, I need a shower just looking at that damage. The no stamina thing at this point has turned into a minor inconvenience when you're capable of hitting with the destructive force of a Moab. Staminaless in Orlando is up next, and you'd think this would be an absolute nightmare, but when you play it smart, it's not that bad. The rafters are a problem easily solved by homing soul mass, and after that we get to the archers. The archers sound like they could cause issues, but they can't hit what they can't see. Hidden Body lets us get up the rafters almost entirely without being noticed by the archery squad. That's GW2 and Orlando 0. Oh, but don't worry, An Orlando still has plenty of time to make up for its loss. Sure, our damage is absolutely broken, but that doesn't mean that there's no challenge with the Super Londo Super Show. We can hit it like a bus, but Shocks and Smoohoo can kill us just as fast. The big issue is without stamina, we don't have the ability to outmaneuver some of their attacks, so it basically becomes a race between who dies first, me or Shocks. Using some stone armor can help survive the initial phase, but being this slow against Golden Stein resin over here is a death wish. 
So the game plan is going to be tank up and two shot stabby, then strip down and kite out smashy. It seemed fairly difficult at first, but just a few tries and the slam jam bites the dust. Hey Guinevere! Bye Guinevere! Londo is now spooky, which means Gwendolyn's doors are open. On our way down, we grab another Firekeeper soul before heading into the boss fight. This fight is barely different than usual, but we have to be careful with the large mass attacks. Without rolling, we have to be very careful about how we sidestep them. I probably could have one-cycled the boss with proper spell usage, but we kill him quickly nonetheless. First Lord Soul on the list is Nito, and with regular Soul Spears chunking him for over a thousand damage, coupled with some tank and spank armor, we get through without any issues. However, we do run into some issues with the all bosses portion of the run. Mainly, this. So without stamina, we don't really have any options for movement, and without movement options, it's pretty much impossible to cross this gap. Unfortunately, that means we have no real way of revisiting the Asylum, which means we can't access the Stray Demon or the Peculiar Doll. Without the Peculiar Doll, that means no Painted World. Thankfully, as I'm pretty sure everyone knows, these areas aren't even remotely required to beat the game. However, by the rule set I've imposed, that means an all bosses run is pretty much improbable. I say improbable because I'm not going to rule out the possibility of it happening. I personally theorized that it might be possible to lure an NPC to the right position and the kick from their backstab could place you on the ledge. Or maybe some kind of other damage knockback could send you over, but nothing I've done as of yet has worked. But really, we're just missing out on Stray Demon and Priscilla. Are any of us really questioning whether or not I have the capability to kill those bosses at this point? Before moving on, we go ahead and purchase more Soul Spears and Homing Soul Masses from Griggs. Next on our list is the Isolith Gauntlet, and to start us off we have Ceaseless Discharge. Running all the way back to the door would be an absolute pain, but that's not really an issue when we can just destroy him before he really gets a chance to cause issues. For the first time in the challenge series, we kill Ceaseless without the use of gravity. For the people doubting we could kill the Stray Demon, we have his even more difficult form, the Demon Fire Sage. As long as he doesn't spam magic and stun lock us, there's very little chance for us to actually lose the fight. 26 seconds and the Fire Sage goes down. Centipede Demon is up next, and while his attacks can be annoying, his health bar isn't very large. It does get close at times, but it's not very long before Centipede gets taken out. Let's talk Bed of Chaos. The left and right orb are fairly easy to take out, but that run to the center? It's by no means a cakewalk. The Bed of Chaos has very little recovery time between her attacks, and that makes this a very tricky fight to navigate. I give it a few tries, and I definitely know this is possible, but I'm going to need to get a few more levels in Vitality to help tank through the attacks before I give it a few more tries. We'll come back to this. <laughs> well, now that it's prison time, we... Oh. Yeah, that's an issue. Thankfully, remembered all the way back in Blight Town to pick up the Great Chaos Fireball. That's gonna let us get out of this prison cell. Okay, real talk, navigating around the Duke's archives without stamina has been the most annoying thing by far. This area's enemies are really annoying to navigate around without mobility, which makes the whole thing pretty tedious. That being said, after a fair amount of time we free Big Hat, grab the Firekeeper Soul, and make our way to the Crystal Cave. Even without Crystal Sorcery and just the base catalyst, Seath's magic resistance really can't compete with Power Within super buffs. Seriously, just looking at this damage makes me feel like I need a shower. After the Blind Meth Attic goes down, we head back to the Bed of Chaos when this happens. Huh. Well, I'm not gonna complain. Thankfully, Force is a good substitute to slowly force our way through the branches and into the core where we can finish the fight. We can then use the souls we gained along the way with some of our consumable souls to get our hands on Crystal Soul Spear and Homing Crystal Soul Mass. I think we're starting to reach nuclear numbers on damage. 
With all the major bosses down, it's time we head to the DLC. There's going to be a pretty common theme with these DLC bosses. We're essentially playing the RNG lottery. All of the bosses have either attacks they can spam from outside our range or have the ability to rush us down and combo us into oblivion. Case in point, Sanctuary Guardian. He can do both of these things, so luck's just going to have to be on our side. Thankfully, Sanctuary Guardian is a very squishy boss, and just three Power Within boosted Crystal Soul Spears will finish the job. Evidently, things with Artorias do get a bit easier. With a bit of poise, it's fairly easy to tank through most of his attacks, and with Power Within, his resistances mean next to nothing. Like, seriously, if you're not convinced yet that this spell is absolutely busted, then I don't know what else to tell you. With Cast Light, we can get our hands on the Silver Pendant and make our way through the township. Once we've made our way to the Chasm of the Abyss, we can officially get our hands on Dark Bead. At this point, I'm pretty sure my spell casts have to be quantified as some kind of divine intervention. The Crest Key did pose an interesting dilemma for me, and at first I tried to lure the Mimic over to the staircase to take him out, but that didn't quite work. It took a few attempts, but eventually I found a way to drop down to the platform and grab the key. I was worried for a second there we wouldn't be able to fight Calamite. Three bosses left to go, and Manus is up first. We do some pretty fantastic damage, but his attacks have brutal amounts of poise break. His ability to stun lock us is very powerful, and we have no way to roll out of the way of his magic attacks. Once again, we find ourselves in an RNG lottery. We need Manus to get close enough to us so that we can hit him, but at the same time we need him to pick his uppercut and swipes, because those are the attacks that we can tank through. It takes a few tries, but eventually Manus finally cooperates and gives us the attacks we need. The Father of the Abyss goes down. Calamy is essentially in the same boat as Manus. If he chooses the right attacks, then we have a great time. If he doesn't, then we get to be very familiar with the You Died screen. Thankfully, Calamy's attack variety isn't quite as annoying as Manus, and we have a much better chance of avoiding most of his attacks. On only our second try, we slay the Black Dragon. Now for Gwyn, we face a different dilemma. Without the ability to parry, he might- Holy crap, he's already dead. And with that, we have officially defeated all of Dark Souls Remastered without stamina. Well, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. That early game, though, was actually pretty difficult. Trying to manage with limited resources and levels was no joke, but I think if I had played it smarter, it wouldn't have been as bad. That being said, the mid game wasn't much of a challenge, but it began to intensify a bit again by the time we reached the end. I think we got pretty lucky with some of those RNG checks, but sometimes that's just the name of the game. As for the next challenge, I've already got something pretty special in the works that's been requested a bit more than a few times. Expect a teaser on what's to come in a few days. While I work on it though, if you have a challenge you'd like to see, then leave it either in the comments below or in the suggestions section of my Discord channel. If it sounds interesting enough, it could end up as a full video like this one. If it's not quite interesting enough to get its own video though, I might still give it a go. I've been doing some of the less interesting challenges as live streams here on the channel, and it's been an absolute blast doing them with you guys. In the meantime though, if you guys did enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up, bop that subscribe button, and ring a tingling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description as always. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later!